not very convincing, but I actually am. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's Wednesday evening. You're listening to Mystic Moon Cafe with Wendy Schindler and Travis Short. Every week we will interview guests that are experts in various fields of the supernatural, paranormal, unexplained, and esoteric. So sit back and let us take you on a journey to educate, enlighten, and entertain as we broaden your horizons. Now, here's your hosts, Wendy Schindler and Travis Short. And it's me, Wendy Schindler, with my co-host, Mr. Travis Short. Hey, Wendy, how are you? Hey, oh, just peachy. How you doing? Oh, I'm not doing too badly. A little tired. Mm-hmm. But uh, other than that, I'm doing fairly well. Good. Glad to hear that. Yeah. How about you? Uh, just hanging in here, kind of uh, anticipating the stormage coming in and uh, seeing. Yeah, it has done... Yeah, it's rained all day in Kentucky and Virginia. Ooh, it got up to almost yeah. 85 in Kansas City today, and it's it's stuffy. Ooh, it feels like you. a storm is coming. Yeah, yeah, lucky us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so how's your day been, though? Pretty good? Oh, not bad, not bad. You know, had that little hiccup where, you know, finding out that the father had passed away yesterday and yes. getting a lot of messages and and having to talk to a lot of different um is it second or third cousins that they were his cousins originally but they like okay I... <laughs> <laughs> well good for you yeah good for you yeah had a lot of uh black sheep uh conversations today oh yeah Wendy, ah. i know i know we we just kind of nobody really tells us anything and we just kind of go off and do our own thing yep that's us <laughs> yeah, well, that's the, those are the most fun type of people. They honestly are. And and sometimes, you know, you hate to see them torn up about about a passing when you know good and well that that person who passed was a real uh, <clears throat> unpleasant person mm-hmm. towards them. Not to their faces uh, generally, but I uh, golly. Golly, 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 yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, so, Travis, are you having a cocktail at this point? Uh, you know, I am. Uh, mm-hmm. I am having a Stella right now. Okay. And a, Stella, a Stella Artois uh, <laughs> beer. And then I'll be moving on to some wine uh, as the show progresses. But, yes, it, was, it wasn't It was a bad day at work. It was mm-hmm. just... Uh, a long it, day. It was, hec- it was long. It was hectic. Uh, mm-hmm. We, You know, I had my, my morning show there on the AM station. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, and had three guests in there today, so that was busy. Kept me hopping, sure. uh, and then and then you know regular managerial duties and sales duties and things like that, and mm-hmm. uh, had some stuff with uh, Vanjie Williams. I had to take care of for her uh, political campaign, and then there was something else that came up. I don't remember, but so yeah, I mean it just just a busy day, and then that drive always gets me. So well, sure, uh, yeah. That it will do. <laughs> yeah, but it was a good day. Very good. Yeah. So. Now, um, Travis and I are talking about uh, doing a what is it cocktail of the cocktail yeah, of the I, day or uh, show or. Yeah, I think it'd be kind of cool to add a segment to the program where that where we have a cocktail or a drink segment, drink recipe segment where we we actually. Uh, or, you know, you and I are drinking the same thing, and maybe the guest uh, is drinking the same thing, and just kind of add a social, quote unquote, social component. It, it's to social our show. hour. It's happy hour. Exactly. Happy it Steve is. <laughs> it is. So I think it would be kind of cool to do that. Um, so uh, we, we have an idea, and, and as Wendy uh, follows up on it, we will let you know more about it. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I had a, uh, it's not your father's root beer. Uh, hard root beer with dinner so good relaxed ready to <laughs> ready to rumble <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly mm-hmm. as these shows should be now um, next week we have uh, one of our favorites uh, mr bill bean will be on with us now, is he a reverend or just is it just bill no he he is he is the right reverend william bean jr um <laughs> he is ordained uh so uh, he is supposed to be back on. You know, it's so funny. Bill and I, you know, I kept uh, Bill as a client, uh, Vanjie as a client, uh, Tony Quest as a client. 
Uh, those are the only three of my of my freelance clients that I kept, and then I've added Ashley Love uh, out of New Orleans. But uh, Bill and I, there are times when Bill and I will talk every day, multiple times a day, and then there are times like right now when he and I will go weeks and just have voicemail messages okay. uh, or uh, email or Facebook messages. Uh, so it is uh, interesting when I don't hear from him, but he, he did finally get back with me. He said he was going to be in Miami next week. Miami or Fort Lauderdale? Miami, I think. Okay. Uh, next week. And he would he would definitely do the show uh, from Miami for us. He would call in and, and do the show. So it's going to be good to have Bill back on. Lots to talk about. Conspiracy theories, the Mandela effect, demonic possession, deliverances, exorcisms, all kinds of stuff. Bill's just a plethora of entertainment and education. Yes, he is. And uh, so always, always fun to have him on the show. So looking forward to that. Um, do we have anything booked into May yet? I honestly, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't, I've got too many windows open on my computer. I don't know if I can get to my, our shared calendar or not. I, I haven't booked anybody yet, but. Soon. Okay. Okay. Carly is in the chat room and go? she says we are okay. sounding good. Oh, okay. Hey, Carly. Thanks, Carly. Good evening. <laughs> Oh, goodness, excuse me. Um, no, oh, we, I, I've been talking, like I say, I've been talking to some people, but I hadn't nailed anybody down on a definite date yet. Just kind of keeping it open in case, like, uh, Cami Anderson got a hold of you and said, oh, we can do it, such and such day. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, I need to follow up with Cami, as a matter of fact. We need to get her and Richard Estep back on, uh, yeah. and then we also need to get them on separately to discuss the individual projects that they have going on. That we do. So... Yes, we do. And then we've got uh, tonight, great guest, uh, another one of our favorite recurring guests. I think we have, right now, we, we have probably, what, a half a dozen favorite recurring guests. We've got Bill, who's always <laughs> fun to have back on. Yes. Uh, Linda Godfrey, mm -hmm. Nick Redfern, mm -hmm. um, and then we've got uh, Let's see. Uh, June, June yes. and her group. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, we have a few. Yes, we so, do. <laughs> I like the returning cast. I like it when they reach out to us and say, hey, uh, we, we want to be back on the show, which is what happened with Nick this time. Right? Well, actually, what happened with Nick last time? Uh, I hounded him this time. He, <laughs> he, <laughs> he last time. Last time his publicist reached out and said, hey, Nick wants to be back on your show. And this time I went, hey, Nick, we want you back on the show. So um, <laughs> it's uh, – it's good to have, have him back on. He's got a new book out. We're going to be talking about it here in a little bit. Uh, another kind of uh, coffee top or tabletop book, uh, you know, easy to read. Uh, so that's kind of cool. So looking forward to, to talking to him. Uh, and then we've got some other guests we're going to try to get on. Uh, I actually have the, the particular publisher of this book um, also sent me there. And you probably got it, too, when you got yours. Um the, the list of other titles that are out right now and other authors that we can interview. Oh, no, I did not because I finally had okay. to reach out to them um, via email and they sent me okay. the e-copy of the book. So, uh, but that's okay. Yeah. So we've got a, got a list of new authors, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of fun books. And I, I, I got June's book in the mail today. Oh, fan <laughs> oh excuse me. Got, fantastic. Yay. I know. I, I opened that up. So those haunted toys <laughs> scared the hell out of me. Yes, completely. Right. Yeah, I know. It's like, holy crap. I'll probably have nightmares just looking at the book. So, yeah, but i are looking forward to that. And we need to have them back on uh, to discuss more of, of their undertakings and investigations, absolutely. endeavors, and all that fun stuff. And we got to talk Mothman. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, it looks like Ross Allison and David Weatherly, who wrote Haunted Toys, will be getting uh, haunted lighthouses and possibly ships. Uh, I think that was the title of the next book they're going to work on. So Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. Very cool. <laughs> so we've got a lot of good, a lot of good caliber guests coming up. Absolutely. And uh, we, of course, have, you know, our, we shout out to our other uh, shows on the network, uh, Crimson Cloak, which is Carly's uh, publishing company. And then she has her radio show. And then we've got David Haslam mm -hmm. uh, from HMSI Publishing. He has his show uh square one squan squan square i can't i never know exactly how to pronounce that show i think it's square one but i'm not positive square one. okay I'm, i wasn't sure or uh, sq1 that it might SQ. be sq mm -hmm. 
Squall Squallon. <laughs> it's Squallon on Spreaker. Squall. Yeah, that is not for people with any kind of speech impediment to say either one of those. The platform that we're on or some of our shows. Well, he is British, so, so we'll cut him some slack on it. Let well, him pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> There's... There's no accounting for taste in the people we hang out with. No, there's really yeah, right? not. We have to be careful, though. Nick Redfern is British. I mean, <gasps> yeah. Oh, right. shh. Don't, don't say anything about Hush. the British. Like, I know. We kicked their asses in that one war. That one war? That, yeah. <laughs> that, little, that little skirmish that happened here? <laughs> exactly. What, 250 yeah. years ago or however many it was? Yeah. Ish. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> right about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right around in there. So, um, so, and, and, uh, some other, some other already or some others coming. Cause you keep track of that. I, you know, I got, not, I, I've got so many, so many things on in my head and so many other things that I'm dealing with. You kind of keep track of who's on our network and things like that. Who's on first, right? <laughs> yes. One of my favorite skits. <laughs> um, well, I believe, uh, a man associated with Carly, uh, uh, he was doing a show on their time, and I think he's going to try to come on with us. And he just does a variety. He talks about tech, about uh, just different different uh, topics pertinent to right now, um, current affairs, I guess that would be, and and gives some advice on on computers and different technical issues. And he's just a, he's a really nice guy. I've listened to the show a couple of times. It's on Saturday nights, usually kind of late, I believe, and. Um, and darn it, his name is escaping me right now. But uh, Carly, help me out in the, in the chat room. What's his name? There may be a lag. I'm going to say, you know, we can't, we can't hear her. You know that, right? You can ask her. It's like when I go and do these live broadcasts <laughs> for the radio station and I'll ask people a question mm-hmm. and they'll shake their head. And I'm like, we're not on TV, damn it. You actually have to move your mouth and speak. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> so... It's like, you know, it doesn't work this way. Um, when I was doing that career fair at the one high school, and I, I put some of the kids on the air with me because I took our remote equipment. And I put them on the air and let them let them talk. And well, I, I say let them talk. And I, I put the microphone in front of their face and they would just like shake their head or, you know, nod up and down or you shake their head. No. And I'm like, uh-huh. come on. I, <laughs> they weren't going to say anything for any amount of money. Yeah, nobody. I know it's crazy. It's like, come on. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's so funny. My my DJs, like board operators, it's politically incorrect to call them DJs. Why? I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure what demographic we're offending by calling them DJs. I don't know if it's the discs or the jockeys that get upset. But are they um, little people? They're not. Well, then they shouldn't get offended, right? I mean, they sh- they shouldn't. But you know, one of my favorite new sayings is, "You got to hand it to midgets sometimes because they can't reach it themselves." <laughs> Oh, damn. <laughs> I would like to say at this point that the uh, the opinions of I, the guests are... We ha- I don't know. We, we haven't done the disclaimer. I've got it recorded. I just forgot to send it to you. Which we've got it. I've got... I, I, since Carly's in the chat room, I've got yes. uh, a disclaimer for all the radio shows. Uh, one for each show in particular so that the views and opinions expressed by the guests are not necessarily those of Crimson Cloak Publishing, the host for Mystic Moon Cafe and Spreaker.com. So we're trying to cover all the bases so that we don't get lawsuits. And basically, Wendy had me do that because of me. Um, it's not – we haven't had a couple of guests. It's just what comes out of my mouth when I'm on the right, show. Right. I'm, like, do, I'm Wendy, covering our bases she's and like, our that, rear ends. Ba- I was going to say, bases is not what you said when you asked me to do this. <laughs> that is not what you said recovering. So, uh. um, Carly Carly has answered. Um, the man's name is John Guzardo, and he will be doing Get in John's Head. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> in, not on. <laughs> well, no, I... I <laughs> you, you've seen you've seen uh, the Austin Powers movies, you know, and you've got the character Mike Myers created fat bastard. And he's well, no, actually, little... no, actually, no, oh. actually, I haven't seen those. Oh, it's, I love those series of movies, but he's he, he does this Scottish uh, character named Fat Bastard, mm-hmm. and there's of course a midget in, in Austin Powers, and he keeps telling him, "Get in my belly, get in my belly," and so when you get in John's head, it just cracks me up mm-hmm. what, with our midgets, right? Like. With our little yeah, people. <laughs> That's what popped in my head as soon as you said it. Right, yeah. mm-hmm. oh. <laughs> Word association this evening. We're going to do really it, well tonight, guys. <laughs> oh, I'm just exhausted. That's what's wrong with me. And 
You know, I would say that the beer has gone to my head, but I actually ate today. I had lunch, which I never do. Good man. Uh, I, I actually I went and had a salad and uh, some grilled chicken strips with uh, sautéed peppers and onions. It was great. Uh, and uh, I haven't eaten since I've been home, but, you know, hey, I, I, if I get one meal in a day, I'm doing good. Okay. So, but... Um, we we do have a wonderful guest tonight. Why don't we we have a song that you're going to play, and this is from one of our uh, one of our regular vaults of music. Yes, and and a friend of the show. She's a friend of mine. Uh, of course, I've never met her on in person, but a uh, Facebook friend out of Austin, Texas. Uh, her name is uh, Jennifer. Well, the the group's name is Jennifer B and the Groove, and uh, she does some fantastic music. Oh, I heard that. <laughs> the knuckles? Oh, I know. Sorry, I thought I muted it. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, all of me pops like that, though. Mm-hmm. But you're, yeah, me too a lot. I'm old, though. Hmm. All right, then. Shall you I go muted, ahead and I play it, that? Then? I muted oh. it so I, could, <laughs> so I could pop my knuckles again. <laughs> Actually, I think I heard the pop top. Popping more so than your no, knuckles. you did not hear the pop top. I have not. The, the pop top was already popped. Hmm. Interesting. All right, then your knuckles sound exactly like popping a, a a soda pop can or beer can. That would. No, I don't drink out of a can. I drink out of a bottle. Stella comes in a bottle. <laughs> comes in a bottle. And you drink it out of a chalice. <laughs> the, vest, oh. the vessel with the pestle has the brew that is true. The chalice with the palace. As the let's see, how, how is it Danny K does that? The chalice with the palace has the brew that is true, the vessel with the pestles and the chalice or the I shoot, I can't remember. I'm gonna have to look it up now, we'll have to post it. Okay. Yeah, funny. Mm-hmm. Funny stuff. Mm-hmm. Danny K always my, was. If, if you're in my head. Get in my head and <laughs> no one wants to go down that road. So you're gonna you're gonna put on our song. Get a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> Please. And hip waiters. A hip waiters and a flashlight. <laughs> And call a plumber. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's not a, not a, not a. It's not a a, a, a road you want to travel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've got uh, this song. What's the song again? Mississippi Queen. Mississippi Queen, and then we'll have. You're going to call Nick Redfern. I'll be talking to him. Yep. And we'll be back in just a minute. Enjoy.
was Jennifer B. in the Groove with Mississippi Queen. But I think um, they get like 20,000, 30,000 at uh, yeah. Roswell. Uh-oh. Hi, guys. Hey, Wendy. Hi. Song's over. I would I would say I would love the song, but we couldn't hear it. we got to figure out how to fix that one particular feature on this platform. Well, I'm thinking I could probably unplug my headphones, but I don't know if that would create one heck of a disturbance or not. So it maybe we should try well that could. at we, some point. We, you and I may do a dry run on that and see if that fixes the problem. But we won't do that with a guest. We won't do that with a guest on. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, we, uh, Nick and I have been just, you know, we actually already finished the interview, so he's going to bed and, and so am I. So we're, we're good. We. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I'll play some music because if I sang, you guys would. Everybody would go away anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so we've uh, we've got one of our favorite recurring guests uh, on the show. We were talking about you a little bit earlier uh, when Wendy and I were just doing the the introduction. We have Nick Redfern with us. Uh, Nick is the author of numerous books on conspiracies, the paranormal, and unexplained mysteries, including uh, the Visible Ink Press Secret History. Conspiracies from Ancient Aliens to the New World Order, the Bigfoot Book, the Encyclopedia of Sasquatch, Yeti, and Cryptid Primates, and the Monster Book, Creatures, Beasts, and Friends of Nature, as well as The Real Men in Black, The NASA Conspiracies, Strange Secrets, On the Trail of Saucer Spies. He's been on 70 TV shows, over 70 TV shows, including the BBC's Out of This World, the Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive, History Channel's America's Book of Secrets, Ancient Aliens, and UFO Hunters. Uh, as well as Science's The Unexplained Files, National Geographic's Paranatural. Uh, originally from the UK, he now resides on the fringes of Dallas, Texas. I like that, the fringes, uh, which is extremely apropos for someone who delves into the fringes of the paranormal and our society. Nick, thank you so much for being on the show to talk about your new book, Secret Societies, The Complete Guide to Histories, Rights, and Rituals. Okay, now oh, thanks for having me on again, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> it is great. Great to have you back on. Thanks. So, Secret Societies, you and I were talking about this. What I love about this book is it's, it reminds me a little bit of 365 Days of UFO Encounters because it's not really there, – there's no one chapter that's necessarily on anything. It's more you pick it up, you find a topic that you want – that you're interested in, mm -hmm. you read about it, and while you're there, the next page happens to go, oh, well, hell, look, there's one I've never heard of. Let's read about this one. It's just – it's kind of – it feeds – it it draws you in and kind of feeds on itself once you start reading this book. Well, yeah, they, that's the sort of the theme of the book. Um, Visible Inc. have asked me to do quite a few of these books over the years where essentially they're sort of like an A to Z type book – containing up to 200 different entries. And that's the same with the Bigfoot book and the Monster book as well that you mentioned. And Secret Societies is, as you said, it's like an A to Z of everything to do with secret societies throughout history and both modern and ancient. Um, but the way it's written, because it's A to Z style, I mean, sometimes readers, including me, you know, get a bit daunted when you've got a face reading like a 450-page book like this one, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
But what I've done, and which I think is a good approach, um, is to have, as I said, 200 entries, and then you can sort of dip into the book as you like and where you like, and you can read, you know, sort of a, an entry on each of Secret Society, and each each one roughly runs to about 800 to 1,000 words. Um, so, you know, in that sense, you can you can start at page one and go right to the very end if you want to, or you can just jump into it at random and just learn about these societies also at random, you know. Yeah, no, that and that that is what I love about it is you know if because it is size wise it's a good size book. Uh, you're looking at let me see, I, the page count. Well, you're well over almost right at 396 pages uh, before you get to the you know your suggested further readings and your research and all of that. So right at 400 page book, and you go oh wow this is just going to be daunting. And then you pick it up and you're like oh wow this actually it's not it's actually a really easy read it's fun uh, it's informative but again it's entertaining like all of yours uh, all of your titles are i've yet to read one that i went god i wish he hadn't wrote that book um they're all they're, they're all uh you know they're on my on my fa- list of favorites when it comes to uh the supernatural the paranormal the esoteric and things like that now you are you are more known for as we talked about on the show you know your research into cryptids uh ufos things like that what what had you steer into secret societies? Well, when the publisher suggested to me or asked me, you know, have you got any ideas for, for new books? And um, we, we kind of came to the idea together of secret societies. The publisher wanted a book on that subject. But what I said was, well, that, that's fine. But what I don't really want to do is a book that just goes over the same old ground. So you've got just the usual suspects so to speak like the illuminati or the bilderbergers or the freemasons what i wanted to do if i was going to write the book was to expose the reader reader to a lot of largely unknown secret societies but which had intriguing stories and tales surrounding them and i think you know that the reader would appreciate that more because you know i find that where i pick a book up sometimes and you think well hang on we've seen all this before it's just but just recycled, you know. So the the task was to come up with, you know, sort of 170, 180 very lesser-known secret societies, but which had really intriguing stories surrounding them, and then to sort of keep the remaining 20 for things like the Bilderbergers and, you know, the, uh, the Council for Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the more esoteric but well-known secret societies, and give the reader something new and hopefully things that they largely haven't been exposed to before really and that's what i did enjoy is uh as i was talking uh to you and uh, before we came on the show you know some of these i've been familiar with um, because secret societies uh has has always been kind of one of those other pet hobbies of mine uh just in, in in passing i'm not an expert on them in any form or fashion but very interested in how that they get started and how they perpetuate through history and then how legends and myths and how they end up many times becoming, you know, much bigger than they actually are through stories and, and the secrecy and things like that. So I, I, I do love the fact that there's some that I know about and then there's some that I didn't know about and that I wasn't familiar with. So what I want to do uh, here for the first part is kind of pick and choose some of the ones that jumped out at me. Yeah. And then I would love to hear which, which were some of your favorites to research or which, you know, which were the ones that surprised you the most and things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start almost, it's not really in the middle of the book, but it's almost in the middle of the book. It's one I'm very familiar with. Uh, some people maybe may not be, it's the hellfire club, which I think is an, is an interesting secret society. It has, you know, it's, it's both European has ties to colonial America. So give us the kind of the overview of the hellfire club and then kind of, how you went into researching that particular society? Well, yeah, again, um, this is one that's sort of, I guess, semi-well-known, but a lot of people may have heard of it, but not really kind of understood the concept and history surrounding it. But uh, it actually goes back to the uh, 1800s in England and a certain number of very powerful figures that um, had interests in... Uh, issues such as alchemy, demonology, um, but also uh, also had a lot of connections to the world of big money and politics in the UK at the time. And um, it was essentially sort of uh, brought into fruition and handled, so to speak, by a man named Sir Francis Dashwood. 
And he um, lived in this huge old uh, abbey in the UK called Medmenham Abbey. And this is in the English county of Buckinghamshire. And it was in this particular old abbey, which is sort of like a classic, typical old building you would see in like one of these 1960s Hammer Horror movies, you know, where Count Dracula <laughs> would hang out, that kind yes. of thing. And um, that's what really what the abbey was like. But um, in some respects, I guess you could make an argument that the Hellfire Club began more as for entertainment uh, than anything else. Uh, the members, for example, would dress up like monks with cowls, and you know, so they had this sort of unusual appearance. But unlike regular uh, monks, they would pray to the devil. Now, much of it, like a lot of cults, sort of revolved around um, power, influence, sex, money, and having a good time. So in other words, it was initially sort of a, a group of friends and colleagues and big businessmen to get together and essentially do whatever they wanted to do. Now, what's particularly intriguing is that as the group uh, grew and its membership became not just sort of friends of Sir Francis Dashwood, but also influential people in the British government. Um, it sort of took on a, a second life, so to speak. Um, one of them, for example, um, the Marquis of Butte, Lord Sandwich, who actually, he has that name because he really did invent the sandwich. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, various other and we people. Thank, and we thank him for that. <laughs> yes, we do. There would not be uh, Subway or anything like it without... Uh, <laughs> Lord Sandwich. But um, what happened was that the group then began to sort of invite powerful figures into the group as a means to allow the group to also get its grip within government. And that's actually what happened, that you had this crossover um, where significant people in government have this secret life, uh, essentially, um, praying and paying homage to the devil with these sort of archaic and esoteric rituals and rites. Um, but as things went even further, what we, <coughs> excuse me, what we found was that the organization began to have strands overseas as well. And there are a number of stories um, about how the Hellfire Club reportedly and allegedly had links with some of the... Um, early U.S. presidents, and also with U.S. politics in general. But fortunately, from our perspective, I guess, um, it pretty much all came crashing down in the latter part of the 1700s when the group sort of fractured and the interest that was originally there sort of fell apart and the political side of it began to collapse as well. And, and it essentially imploded on itself. But there's no doubt that from the early years, at least, the Hellfire Club sort of epitomized secret societies in the sense that they start up very appropriately secret and very often small and not particularly uh, significant. But then all of a sudden, they either get pulled into or they create links within government, within um, powerful um, different corridors of power. And before you know it, it's like they're almost running the place, running the country or the government in kind of like a shadow government type environment. Yeah, I and now when when you finish in, in, in the, the section where you talk about the Hellfire Fire Club, you actually... Uh, show it kind of going, being extinguished, to, to continue the fire pun, uh, in 1781. Has there ever been any linkage trying to show that it has resurfaced in modern times? Well, um, it, it ha I mean, there have been people who've sort of followed the teachings, for example, of uh, Sir Francis Dashwood, but there hasn't been, you know, a literal hellfire club that we could call something that was on the same level. But that's not to say that there haven't been people within the British government and politics who weren't tied to groups that practiced controversial rites and rituals. And some of them may have certainly, well, were certainly tied together with uh, various figures linked to the Hellfire Club. But it wasn't a case of sort of literally 100 percent resurrecting the Hellfire Club now. So what uh, what types of, of research did you do? Uh, to 
to delve into the Hellfire Club. Um, because obviously yeah, well, there's no, obviously you can't interview people. So, no. <laughs> so, so how, how did you go about tracing, you know, the lineage back and, and picking yeah. up these stories? Well, one of the things I did, you know, the, the easy approach, but what I call also the lazy approach, is that you just go out and buy a bunch of books on secret societies published <laughs> in the last 10 years and rewrite right. them. But, that, but that's, there's just no point in doing that. You know, as an author, you want to sort of remain stimulated. So what I always like to do if I'm writing about historical mysteries is to try and find as many sort of old texts um, as you can to essentially go back to the original words. Now, certainly 10, 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't so easy because, you know, you either had to go to libraries and special collection libraries to get books. But today, you know, you can find a lot of old books that, you know, the text at least has been placed online. And, you know, I try not to rely on them completely, but to a degree you have to. But I, I prefer to sort of go back to the original text, you know, from the 1800s, the 1900s, and and look at what was being said back then, rather than looking at how things have been sort of changed and altered and exaggerated or romanticized on over the years, mm -hmm. to where it becomes almost like Chinese whispers, you know, the story <laughs> 300 years later is very different to actually how it was back then. So I always try and go with original historical material um, to try and, you know, tell a story if it, you know, if, it, if it's if it's relevant in terms of, you know, being two or 300 years old, obviously. Now, in relation to the Hellfire Club, there's actually, uh, at least in, in the, the, the books and the stories that I've read and the research that I've done, a, a tie to colonial America with Benjamin Franklin, that he was supposedly had some interaction with the Hellfire Club on some of his trips to uh, the UK. Yeah, and that, that sort of comes back to this issue of sort of networking and creating links and connections with powerful people. And this, of course, you know, was in the, in the early years of the United States, you know, its um, formation and so forth. Uh, I mean, very early years. And, um, and so, in, in other words, this is a, you know, a point in time when America, uh, the United States of America, was sort of, you know, g getting its its feet on the ground, so to speak, as, a, as an independent nation. But the Hellfire Club, having already infiltrated, if you like, or influenced the British government, saw an opening where potentially, you know, they could have a significant role on the other side of the Atlantic. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, what happened, of course, was that this was right around the time, um, you know, when the whole thing with the Hellfire Club collapsed anyway. Now, you know, it's interesting to speculate, had the Hellfire Club not collapsed, you know, not long after, you know, the United States was really, you know, coming to fruition, mm -hmm. and had Dashwood himself not died in 1781, we may well have seen, you know, a, a far greater influence in uh, American politics on the part of some of the, the politicians attached to the Hellfire Club. And, you know, it's intriguing to speculate how that may actually have changed things had, had that actually actually occurred. I no, think absolutely. they've resurrected. They've resurrected and they're, <laughs> they're running the GOP today. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Sold their souls. <laughs> that was damn great. <laughs> <laughs> yes mm -hmm. well now you mentioned something there that i think uh does one of the the common threads in a lot of the secret societies is their impact on government and and not just the u.s government but the but governments worldwide mm -hmm. because you mentioned the illuminati you mentioned the bilderbergers you mentioned the trilateral commission all of these have over the years been tied to uh political uh, individuals, politicians, as well as world government. So let's kind of take that and, and follow that thread a little bit. So we start with the Hellfire Club, one of the one of the earliest, and then you've got these others. So let's talk in any order that you want about the Bilderberger, yeah. uh, the, the Trilateral Commission. Uh, oh, uh, not Oak Grove. What's the other one? Uh, Illuminati. Uh, the Illuminati, and then there's uh, there was another one. Yeah, like uh, the Bohemian Group. The Bohemian Bohem Group. Yes, the Bohemian Group. Yeah. Yes. Well, actually, you can kind of really, in some respects. Uh, lump them all together. And I'll explain what I mean by that. 
um, secret societies, by definition, should be secret. You know, nobody should know about them other than the members. That's why they're called secret societies. <laughs> but just about everybody has heard of, you know, the Illuminati. And, you know, if you look up on secret groups, it won't find, take you a second or two to see links to information on, like, the Council for Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, Bohemian Grove, um, and so forth. And so what you have is sort of this, you know, like a, a paradox, a, a sec secret societies and secret groups, which everybody knows about. <laughs> but <laughs> although they know the term and they may have an understanding of, you know, some of what the work is, because a lot of it, you know, with like the some of these organizations, which sort of they kind of span the world of government and the world of secret societies at the same time. And although people have heard of them, they're not necessarily always aware of the scale of what these organizations do. Now, like the Council for Foreign Relations and so on, um, a lot of the work of these groups revolves around, you know, sort of getting involved with, with agencies like the United Nations and big banking uh, communities, that sort of thing, and really sort of trying to mold and dictate, I don't mean dictate as in literally dictate, but dictate in the terms of projecting how they would like to see the world 10 years from now, then 20 years from now. So a lot of their work is sort of slow, secret, strategic type work designed to increase the economies of this country or this nation to determine, you know, who's going to become the next dictator on the world stage, who has to be gotten rid of, um, and so on. So, in other words, it's not a bunch of people, with these particular groups, it's not a case of, you know, having sort of infernal rituals in a dark area of woodland at midnight on Halloween. It's more along the lines of essentially having behind closed doors meetings to really try and sort of control and manipulate and dictate, as I said, the future of society. Uh, everything from, you know, um, the military, economics, um, world wealth, dispersal of wealth, and so on. So in other words, yes, the work they do is secret, but very often the names are not so secret, but people just aren't aware of the full scope of what's going on. So if we were to break down these in, in kind of the, the individual histories of like the Bilderbergers, the, the Trilateral Commission, the Illuminati, in what order would you look at doing that? I mean, as far as, because I know many people say that many of these are offshoots of the Illuminati or the Illuminati is offshoots of the Freemasons yeah. and th things like that. So how, if you were to dissect and kind of, or kind of diagram the history of some of these politically rooted and, in, and intertwined societies, how would you go about doing that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I think I would probably start with uh, the Bohemian Club and its location, the meetings, Bohemian Grove. And, um, and so for people who aren't aware of it, Bohemian, the Bohemian Club is the name of the organization, and Bohemian Grove in California is where they have their meetings. Now, this is very much, this, the group itself is sort of steeped in symbolism and um, law and legend and essentially it, it's a, an organization which is filled with um, the extremely rich, the powerful, major pop world politicians, um, famous stars in Hollywood who get together and they have these um, rituals and rites late at night which people have suggested range from the very down to earth sort of, you know, you pledge your allegiance, etc., right up to rumors and claims of human sacrifice at the other end of the scale. And um, I guess the best way I can describe the Bohemian Club, um, how it's been described by many people who've looked into it, is kind of like a, a real-life equivalent of the story told in Eyes Wide Shut, but on a far bigger oh, yeah. scale the movie with uh, yes. Nicole Kidman and Tom, and, uh, Tom Cruise. Um, but albeit, as I said, on a far greater scale and on a worldwide scale. But yes, you, you know, you have, like, for example, presidents, prime ministers, royalty, actors, you know, the powerful and the influential. 
and uh, and they ha- they have these sort of specific uh, rituals at Bohemian Grove, which is an area very shrouded by woodland and trees, which is done deliberately so people are not really able to see, you know, what's going on there at all. Um, but you know, it's it's an interesting situation where. You know, you have this group, which for many people, a lot of people just dismiss them as a, you know, a bunch of old guys who get together and and have a good time. And that could be seen as like the simplistic approach of it. <coughs> excuse me. But um, that's not actually, <coughs> excuse me, that's not actually how it really is. It, it's far more a group that, um, not unlike some of these political organizations, um, actually has, you know, sort of long-running goals, um, major aims that it follows, and is intent, you know, on, on putting those aims and goals into place. So so the Bohemian Grove is kind of where you would you would start diagramming and, and moving. Yes, on. but I think it's fair to say that, you know, things like the Illuminati um, and the imagery and, every, and the mystique that surrounds them, um, I think had it not been for it, groups like the Illuminati, you probably wouldn't have this um, sort of mystery-filled, almost magical aspect that some of these groups have today. Now, as far as the Illuminati is concerned, its its official title was the Order of the Illuminati. And although um, it didn't exist in its, um, in its sort of a definitive form until the 18th uh, century, the origins of it date back to the 1400s, and spe- uh, specifically in Spain. Now, this was a group, again, kind of like the Hellfire Club, which was fascinated by the world of the supernatural. And the Illuminati recruited people like, for example, uh, alchemists, alchemy being this ancient um, skill, if you like, allegedly being able to turn what are called base metals like tin and lead into precious metals like silver and gold. And it was reputedly uh, achieved by literally sort of the alteration of atoms, which is the best way we would describe it today. But so a lot of alchemists were brought into the Illuminati, also occultists, and um, it pretty much um, all began with a man named Adam Weishaupt in Ingolstadt, Bavaria. And at the time, he was a professor of religious law, but he also was someone who sort of um, combined mysticism into the, into the brotherhood of the Illuminati. And it, it became sort of more than what it was in, initially intended to be, which was like a political reform group. And it became, again, almost like a, a political group, but with a supernatural overtone dictating it. And um, a large number of the um, sort of belief systems, the customs and the, uh, the outlook, if you like, and the, the way the Illuminati worked was actually not too dissimilar at all to have the, the Masons and their orders, you know, and, and their rituals and so on. So there was certainly a degree of sort of borrowing, you know, the, the imagery, this sort of um, engaging imagery that, that certainly, you know, lured a lot of people in. But um, now, as far as the Illuminati goes today, this is where it kind of gets controversial. Um, now, because up until the 1700s, I mean, the Illuminati was, was pretty much like a, um, you know, a very powerful organization. But by the 1780s, it began to fracture and its um, strength and power was not what it once had been. However, there are rumors that sort of a splinter angle of the Illuminati existed and rather than being sort of out in the open um, they then began to infiltrate other secret societies with a view to essentially creating a new Illuminati but not specifically under that name but it would still be following the teachings and the beliefs and the rituals and the sort of the power obsessed angle of the Illuminati Um, So that's why today even there are beliefs that the Illuminati still exists, but it does so in very much like a camouflaged way rather than openly admitting that it still exists, which was the case back in the 1800s. And the... um you mentioned their their official title is the Order of the Illuminati, and we've kind of abbreviated it just to to, uh, the Illuminati, but it was those that were seeking enlightenment, correct? 
Well, that's right. I mean, that, it's interesting. You can find that within, you know, many of these, um, specifically the occult-based secret societies, where, you know, as you said, they're looking for so-called illuminated supernatural information. You know, it's almost like opening the key to the door that is going to allow you access to, you know, endless power, influence, the ability to achieve what the average person cannot achieve in life. And when you have an entire group of people doing that, then you have what was the original goal of the Illuminati, almost like a a secret order of supermen, if you like, um, whose doctrine was driven by the world of the occult. Yeah. Now, you you do uh, mention uh, some things that are not necessarily uh, so so dark. Uh, some some of these have kind of dark histories about them, uh, and, and the the occult and and the, the the paranormal aspects. But you also have some others. One, I think that. Many people uh, have have kind of uh, maybe not forgotten. This one wasn't necessarily uh, occultic or anything like that, but it did come to rise in in the U.S. in the '40s. Was the American Nazi Party, which is political. It's also a secret society, sort of, <laughs> with their ties back to Nazi Germany. What can you tell us about that so- that society? Well, yeah, I mean the the American Nazi Society. You know, just just the very name of it, you know, is is controversial. You know, we think of the Nazis, we think of Nazi Germany and the atrocities. Then when you realize that, you know, there's uh, the the issue of the American Nazi Party, you can understand quite easily why people, you know, get, get um, upset and, and angry by this. But it was actually established not that long ago, back in 1959, by a guy named George Rockwell. And um, as you can imagine, just about everything, you know, about the group um, was controversial. Um, now, it was originally called, uh, sort of a bit of a tongue-tied title, but it was the World Union of Free Enterprise National Socialist, which is a far more <laughs> inflammatory <laughs> name, basically, yeah. you know. Which and a mouthful. Probably, <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, there was probably a reason for that. You know, the, sort of the, the longer the name and the less sort of tantalizing the name, it doesn't necessarily attract people as the term. When I say attract, I mean attract their attention in right. terms of thinking, what on earth is this, rather than literally attracting them, you know. Um, but, you know, call himself the ANP, the American <laughs> Nazi, the Nazi Party, is a very sort of different thing altogether. But, um, you know, there, there's no doubt that, um, you know, their, their sort of... Um, direction was driven by Adolf Hitler, even though, you know, the, the Nazis thankfully lost the Second World War and, you know, Hitler was no more either. Mm-hmm. Um, but they certainly, you know, based their ideology on Hitler's teachings and um, and they were sort of, the members were, you know, encouraged to, you know, follow Hitler's teachings, even to the extent of, you know, giving a Sieg Heil salute, mm-hmm. um, which was, you know, the the infamous salute that everybody knows that the the Nazis used. Um, But, um, you know, they were sort of heavily also involved in in things like white power, you know, and and again, you can understand why that is, because these people, you know, had this had this warped vision, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, what happened was that, you know, the groups like this, what so often happens is that they gained sort of a high degree of infamy to where a lot of people have heard of them and heard the name and know who they are. But despite being well known, you know, they never really uh, achieve a great deal, thankfully. Um, and that was certainly the case, you know, with the with the American uh, Nazi Party. Um, but it too, you know, in uh, was, I won't say forced to change its name, but decided to, and this occurred in 1967, when they changed the name again to the National Socialist White People's Party, which, you know, again, tells you exactly where they're coming from. Um, But, um, you know, it's one of these situations where the group continued because, like so many cults and and, um, alternative and controversial groups, it had a very um, controversial uh, character, George Rockwell, who created it, now, like a lot of leaders of cults and secret societies and organizations like this, Rockwell was a very sort of, you know, he could be extremely charismatic at times. 
um, and he had the ability to sort of lure people in, mm-hmm. you know, just reeling them in, so to speak. And, you know, that can be quite dangerous, really. Um, but he ended, uh, his life ended uh, in 1967 um, with a bullet. Um, and, you know, this demonstrates um, exactly what can happen uh, when you start getting involved in some of these ultra extreme groups. So, mm-hmm. you know, the the history of the American Nazi Party is fraught with um, controversy one way or another. And, um, you know, it demonstrates, um, but it also demonstrates, you know, the, the, the potential danger that can happen when um, an extremist group begins to, you know, um, essentially expand and more and people more and more people come to know about it you know no um so this is kind of the uh, the the forerunner if you will or the the predecessor to what we see in this country today with neo-nazis and uh some of the the more racially uh, enraged groups yes i mean you know it's an unfortunate thing in the world today you know the way the world is that you know, so very often we place prejudices on the way people look, you know. Yeah. Um, and and it's a, it, 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 as I said, it is an unfortunate part of the work of how society is today. Um, but, you know, I think from my perspective, you know, it, it's granted some people say, well, it's difficult. But, you know, it, the, the goal would be to try and, you know, place everybody, you know, I, look at and look at everybody individually you know mm-hmm. and don't get caught up too much in in sort of um imagery you mm-hmm. know and um sort of profiling everybody just because of this reason or that reason and um and I understand in some cases you know it can be it can be tough but on the other hand if you go down that path you know of just placing everybody in one particular category but not necessarily deliberately, but you can find yourself then going down a very dangerous path. Yes. You know, without giving too much thought about, should we be doing this? Well, we're all, it's people sometimes think it's almost inevitable that we have to do it. I mean, I actually read an article just recently, quite a disturbing one, how um, a significant figure in government said he felt that the way the world is now... It's inevitable that within, you know, less 30, 40, 50 years and onwards, we'll be living in like a 1984 slash Brave New World dystopian world. Not because of sort of jackbooted troops taking over the country, but because bit by bit with our, you know, freedoms being taken away and so on, that we'll slowly slide into it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would look back on 50, 50 years early and then say, wow, you know, look how it's changed not by some violent, dramatic revolution, but just by, you know, um, just taking away this little thing at one mm-hmm. point and something else at another point. And then before you know it, you are living in this kind of Orwellian world, you know. Yeah, which which is not fun. No one wants to live in no. that particular no. society. No, they <laughs> yeah, no matter away. what they think, they, they, yeah. they do not want to. Now, no. you, you mentioned that in the 60s, they, the, the American Nazi Party changed its name. Could you tell me the name one more time? Yes, um, it was in 1967, and um, Rockwell changed it from the American Nazi Party to the National Socialist White People's Party. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring that up, because Wendy and I were talking earlier today, uh, that particular group, or slight variation on that name, but that similar sounding name is actually holding a rally in the town where I work at the end of April, uh, which blew my mind. Uh, but it actually, they, they tried to book the state park, and they said it was going to be a family reunion. And then somehow it got leaked out that it was actually a white supremacist group that right. was coming. So I've actually been trying to get a representative on my Wednesday morning talk show on the radio station that I manage there in eastern Kentucky. It was funny because I had my <laughs> producer there this morning. I'm like, have you gotten any word back from the white supremacist? And he's like, no. And why do you have a death wish? He said, why are you trying to get yourself killed? I said, I'm not. I'm not the one contacting them. The email has your contact information on it. 
I said, and, <laughs> I said, and it's controversial. It's impacting our community. And if they happen to show up and and regional or national media covers it, and we've been sitting here on our thumbs, the owner is not going to look favorably on the fact that we let this story slip by. So we're going to try to cover it as best we can. But I was, I was literally, I and several people, business owners, uh, the mayor, uh, some other of the politicians, uh, some of the state elected politicians have already written uh, formal letters. Uh, basically not supporting this particular rally and this function, but they're, they're, they're just totally appalled that this would happen. And it's one of those things, you know, it, it's sad that we still see this type of thing in, in this country in the 21st century, but you're absolutely right. You know, that those seeds, they, they, unfortunately they, they haven't really left, especially in the South. And that was, I was, I would said all that to segue to another uh, group here that I want to jump across the pond, as it were, and talk about uh, some things on the other side of the Atlantic. But the the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, which you know is very had, again come in, came into the limelight again recently in the in the 2016 presidential election uh, with the the Grand Wizard there, and, you know, and, and possible ties to Donald Trump and things like that. But this is a group that had its origins here in this country, you know, in the South where I'm from, where Wendy's from, where you have chosen to live mm -hmm. <laughs> yourself, you know, there <laughs> on the fringes of Texas. But this was, at, at a time, a very secret society in this country. Yeah, do you talk about the Ku Klux Klan? Yes, yes. Feel you mean. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, um, the, the history of the, you know, the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan goes back a long, long way. And, you know, the, the, the significant part, but I don't mean significant from a positive perspective, is that, as you say, it still has... You know, a significant holds significant sway um, to this very day, and um, you know, I think it's unfortunate. Um, you know, that should be the case. I mean, to give you an example of how sort of serious people took the the threat of the KKK as well, um, the original um, FBI before it was actually called the Federal Bureau of Investigation it actually existed years before, and even as far as um, July 1908, the Bureau investigation, which was the original name of the FBI, um, didn't really have sort of um, laws, so to speak, in place, you know, to legislate with the KKK. But what they did have was sort of a, a team of agents that followed everything they were doing, because even back then, the FBI astutely realized that this was an organization that was you know, very controversial and was generating a lot of followers. And some of the FBI's files on the Ku Klux Klan have now been declassified. And they literally go back decades and decades, you know, demonstrating how seriously the FBI, you know, took this and, um, and, and essentially kept watch on them for, on them for years and years. So. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it, it is one of those secret societies that has continued uh, you know, and and I hate to use the term evolved because they really haven't, but they have they have and I can't even say they progressed. I don't know exactly how they have survived and they have adapted. I guess maybe a, the best way. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things I would point out: people may not know this, but by even by the early 1920s, um, their membership was in excess of a hundred thousand at the dawn of the 1920s. You mm -hmm. know, that, uh, you think of that, six figures. Uh, that's a lot of people. Yes. yes. It is. Uh, a whole lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I want to jump um, across the Atlantic and, and choose one. And the reason that it jumped out at me is because in the, uh, in, in kind of in the first couple of sentences when you're introducing it, you mentioned one of my favorite authors and you mentioned one of my favorite stories by my author. The author is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and my favorite story is The Hound of the Baskervilles. But I'm talking about The Cannibal Cult. And that is, that, I mean, the, title, it, the title in and of itself would make you go, holy crap. Uh, <laughs> what the hell? No doubt. But, but well, yeah, no, I guess. true story, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a story that goes back to um, centuries ago. Um, in the English county of Devon. Now, Devon is in the southwest of England, and it's where, you may just mention Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, it's where Conan Doyle set his novel, his classic Sherlock Holmes novel, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Now, in the novel, the, the story itself, it's set in this sort of uh, foggy, misty, mysterious area called Dartmoor, 
And Dartmoor is like rolling moorland, as the name suggests, um, and it's covered by sort of ancient stone circles, evidence of prehistoric man, um, fields, uh, woodland, and it's very often shrouded in fog and a very creepy atmospheric place. And if you've ever seen, if any of the listeners have ever seen any of the movie versions of The Hound of the Baskervilles, oh, yes. you'll know exactly and instantly what um, Dartmoor looks like. Now, there's a story which actually goes back... Um, well, nobody's sort of 100% sure, but we're definitely talking sort of six or 700 years ago when this story first began to circulate um, about a family called the Gregg family that lived on the wilds of Dartmoor. And Dartmoor also has like a, a network of caves and caverns and uh, old mining areas, mining shafts that have fallen in on themselves and that are now sort of um, no-go areas, you know, and all these sort of tunnels and caverns uh, pepper the, the ground underneath Dartmoor. And supposedly the Gregg family f had a full understanding of these sort of old tunnels and where they led to, and to the point where they kind of descended underground and spent most of their time living in these old um, caves and caverns. And if they saw sort of unwary travellers passing by, you know, they would, um, they would kidnap them and kill them. And they didn't just do it because for warped reasons or because they were crazy. Well, they were crazy, but uh, <laughs> they did it because they reverted or resorted to cannibalism. And so they were basically um, kidnapping and killing people for food. And... Within the and in and around the local town of Biddeford, uh, where all this occurred, um, rumours began to circulate um, that there was another offshoot of the cannibals in a smaller little village called Clavelli, and that's where the story then really began to to dominate. And the local government in the towns and the villages in the area decided eventually that this sort of cannibal cult, I mean Clavelli, um, had to be stopped. And so a group of men got together and essentially um, went into the caves and were faced by this sort of horrified sight of dead bodies and body parts strewn up and, um, you know, ready for cooking, essentially. And reportedly, most of the family were, you know, crazy as a loon and were inbred and, you know, suffering from mental, uh, psychological abnormalities and physical abnormalities as well. And reportedly, they were all eventually um, killed one by one. Some of them were killed in the cave. Others were hung in the village um, square, much to the, uh, you know, the delight, I guess, of the locals who were finally <laughs> free of this cannibal cult. But, um, but it was a very sort of eerie story, which would be sort of ripe for a, you know, um, a horror movie. This, this right. group of people who decided to sort of go against, not just go against the law, but go against nature and create, for want of a better term, a cannibal cult living primarily underground in the old caves of, of the UK. Uh, now, I have heard uh, that this particular, uh, or perhaps this particular story gave rise to, as you mentioned, horror movies, that it, that it may have given rise to or been the, the in inspiration for, back in the 70s, uh, the Hills Have Eyes, and then more recently with the, the, the Wrong Turn series of movies about the mutated, disfigured cannibal families. Uh, did, did you come, was that any part of the research that you came across in, in looking at it as it has been told through modern times that maybe it was picked up by one of these producers, directors, or, or so forth? Well, I haven't picked up anything specifically, but I think, you know, you can find in lots of parts of the world stories of people who've sort of left society behind them. I mean, I talk about one case in the book, nothing to do with cannibals, I should stress, <laughs> but a, a group of people who decided to opt out of the 20th century and built a little village in Wales, surrounded by trees, and it was almost like a little Lord of the Rings type uh, environment, and it's still there, but the government didn't know about it for like five or six years. Um, and, you know, they created this entire society in, you know, in the latter part of the 20th century, and nobody knew about it at all. And, uh, of course, the government uh, was, frowned upon it eventually because, you know, the people weren't paying taxes. They just set up these sort of, almost, like I said, Lord of the Rings kind of little villages. And eventually the government backed down and let them stay. But it shows, you know, that this kind of thing 
does go on. But I think, you know, when you look at all around the world, you can find stories of wild people who have sort of left society behind them or were never part of society and lived sort of almost like animalistic lives, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked things like feral children raised by wolves, that kind of thing. But also, you know, it's not... A, a, it's not a sort of a large leap from there to things like, you know, The Hills Have Eyes and, um, you know, The um, Wrong Turn and things like that. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of these stories all around the world do have a basis in fact. And, you know, some of them may have just been, mm -hmm. as they used to be known a couple of hundred years ago, it was like mountain men, you know, they just yes. live in the wild. But some of them may not, you know, some of them may have sort of crossed the line and you have these sort of freakish families, you know, with a with an appropriately large cooking pot in the kitchen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Would, Bath time! That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, another... And, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so yeah, if you ever out in the woods, you know, and you hear somebody start <laughs> playing the banjo, it's like best just to run, you know. Just run. Fast. <laughs> Always. My, Always. My, gran my grandma was is from, was from uh, down in the, the deep Ozarks down on the Missouri-Arkansas mm -hmm. border. And even she would say things like, you don't mess with the hill folk. Um, mm. and <laughs> yeah, for, for grandma to come along with that saying, you know, and she grew up of what I would have considered the hillbillies, um, mm -hmm. oh, no, no, you don't mess with the hill folk. So <laughs> scary, scary individuals. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, mm -hmm. We actually, uh, in, in the town, well, actually, it's the neighboring town from where I'm working right now in Pikeville, Kentucky. I, I work in Prestonsburg. Uh, Pikeville is the, 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 the next, well, actually, it's larger than Prestonsburg, but it's, it's a neighboring city. They're having Hillbilly Day Festival this, this week. That is their annual event. And I was telling Wendy this morning, it, it's a little disconcerting <laughs> as you drive through on US 23, and they've got these big, you know, uh, KDOT, Kentucky Department of Transportation, signs, flashing signs on the side of US 23 saying, Welcome, Hillbillies. And it, it's just a little disconcerting driving through and seeing that. So <laughs> it's, it is. It's it's a little disconcerting. It really is, yep. to say to say the least. <laughs> yes. Now, a, a, another one of my other favorite stories um, that again coming from from uh, England and the UK area uh, that you tie to a secret society is the story of Jack the Ripper. Now, I'm I'm very familiar with Jack the Ripper. I've read many books on it. Not familiar with any secret societies attached. Well, yeah, I mean, this actually, uh, well, I should begin by saying, you know, the story of Jack the Ripper is probably, you know, the most infamous serial killer of all time. And part of it is because, you know, the name, you know, it's, sort of like, the, it's like a, a perfect name, Jack the Ripper. And, of course, the mystery's never been solved. And I think that's an important issue when it comes to anything, you know, along these lines. It remains fascinating to people because it hasn't been solved, you know, rather than it specifically has. It's kind of like Roswell, you know, or what's going on in Area 51. The fascination relates to the mystique rather than what we actually know about it. But over the years, there have been numerous theories put forward, um, you know, as to who exactly Jack the Ripper was, or in some cases, you know, it, it may have been... Um, more than one person but one of the more intriguing theories has been put forward um and it has some people who think he has merit and others who think you know they're less impressed is the idea of like a freemason connection mm -hmm. now it sort of revolves around the uh, uh, prince albert victor who's the duke of clarence in the in the british royal family at the time and the story goes that um he would sort of spend his time at night um roaming around sort of in clandestine fashion in the, street, in the streets of London's East End, which back then was a very dangerous area to hang out. You know, it really was like you see in like the Sherlock Holmes movies, you know, foggy little alleyways in the back streets of London, and, you know, you take a walk down there, you're liable not to come back again. You know, you find your, your body ends up in the River Thames in London, you know, mm -hmm. the next morning, that kind of thing. And even the police, you know, sort of viewed a lot of the parts of London then as no-go areas. It was pretty much law at the time, but supposedly Prince Albert Victor was fascinated by this sort of sort of other world that he was never really exposed to. You know, just being kind of um, closeted in this, you know, this um, 
royal family, so to speak, which didn't really get to see the real England, so to speak. Um, now, there's a story, uh, well, actually, there's sort of variations on the story. Um, one suggests that um, Prince Albert Victor um, was someone who frequented a lot of the uh, East End London prostitutes and contracted syphilis and essentially went mad from the from the side effects. There wasn't really any good treatment then, and um, and it was all hidden, um, you know, behind closed doors. One of the theories is that he was actually Jack the Ripper himself. That in his deranged state, mm-hmm. um, he he went around London killing. Um, these prostitutes and one of the stories is that there was no way that the royal family could be implicated you know with the story of Jack the Ripper and these murders and so uh, a powerful order of Freemasons within the government that secretly knew the story or been exposed to it um, engineered a situation where the surviving prostitutes and their friends would be killed one by one so as that they wouldn't be able to talk about what they knew um, because some of the uh, prostitutes have supposedly been talking with each other about who you know, the killer was. And so, in other words, the idea was to sort of create um, the, the image of Jack the Ripper and portray him as nothing more than a, a crazy serial killer, when some of the killings, at least, may have been work of agents of the, the Freemasons actually killing the prostitutes and putting the blame on Jack the Ripper, so the story of... Prince Albert Victor wouldn't get out. And um, you have other people who suggest that the, um, the, uh, the killer himself wasn't actually Prince Albert Victor himself, but he was also a man, instead it was a physician named um, Thomas Gull. And he uh, was someone who tra- we know treated um, Prince Albert. And one of the theories there is that um, Gull was asked to essentially get rid of the friends of these prostitutes that had already been killed. And so, you know, you have the legend of Jack the Ripper actually sort of being given life out of earlier real killings. And so it becomes a very controversial and almost quite convoluted situation mm-hmm. where, you know, you could have had a real killer that as some people suggest was Prince Albert Victor, then you have a Freemason connection trying to make it look like just a deranged serial killer and drive all the evidence away from the royal family. But, um, but the, the one thing that is in existence in all, the three, in all the theories that relates to Jack the Ripper is this sort of Freemason tie, if you like. Which, and this one, did inspire a movie because it was the the, the uh, graphic novel from hell also followed this this line of thinking as did the movie with johnny depp but also had been done several years before in another movie murder by decree uh that yeah, had christopher yeah. uh, i love that movie yeah christopher yeah. Plummer as sherlock holmes and james mason as dr yeah. watson one, one of <laughs> mason's last roles but a really good movie but yeah i remember because i remember seeing that movie years ago and then i remember reading the graphic novel from hell going okay what what the hell this is not an original theory i i've seen this in a movie already <laughs> and then, and then i watched the movie with johnny depp so um you know jack the ripper is one of one of those of my favorite unsolved mm-hmm. mysteries because there's so much there and one of those things you know i we will never i don't think we will never know what took place or who we who won't. actually i mean you know, I mean, never mind just the Freemasons and the royal family. You know, you have theories that, um, you know, range from a, a deranged butcher to to even like a midwife, which, you know, people have called her like Jill the Ripper or Jane yeah. the Ripper, you know. Yeah. Uh, you have other theories that he may have been an American doctor, um, a Russian doctor. You know, the, the list's endless. And I think it's like a lot of these old mysteries, like Roswell, the further and further they become part of history the more and more, it's not so much they become like folklore because something clearly happened, but they take on almost like a a folkloric legendary status because they become almost mythical, you know what I mean? Absolutely. They've they've taken on a life of their own. Yeah. And uh, and and in many ways, the theories of who Jack the Ripper could have been may be far more intriguing and interesting than who he actually was. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, the the worst-case scenario for all the reasons people who've done written books on it would be 
if we actually really did get the answer, you know, and it was just somebody who was so irrelevant, you know, that know. people would be like, oh, no, you know, why couldn't it have been somebody from the highest levels of government? You know? Right, no, it'd be great if it was a, another prostitute who was just taking out the competition. She wanted to corner the market. So oh, that's, that's a, that, well, that, that could be a movie, you know. They could. I mean, it'd be a great You theory. would copyright that one. You know? I should. Uh-oh. Yeah. Mark, mark it down right now, Wendy. Make a note. I'm going to as quickly before note somebody else grabs sell. it. You know, it's, it's actually another one of the, the prostitutes. <laughs> well, I want to jump to a couple of other of the secret societies that kind of play more to the other areas that, that you are known for. And that's more of the, the UFO and, and the cryptid kind of thing. So I want to start. The first one that I want to start with is a very tragic uh, secret society. And, and this made, you know, international news back in the 90s. And that was Heaven's Gate, uh, which mm-hmm. was a, a religious cult with UFO slants and, uh, you know, ended up in a mass suicide, probably yeah. one of the one of the worst, you know, religious mass suicides since uh, Jim Jones uh, and, and 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 his uh, uh, con- his his conclave there in Africa. So in, in researching Heaven's Gate, first of all, you know, it kind of explained to us the the I would say the rationale behind uh, Applewhite's thinking, but I don't think there was any. But kind of the, just give us for many people that may not be familiar, just. Just kind of give us the the overview of, of the Heaven's Gate because I yeah. love the fact that it's actually it's Heaven's Gate because the, these stories are alphabetized. But you got Heaven's Gate on one side of the page and Hellfire Club on the other side of the page. So it's this <laughs> it's this nice juxtaposition. I didn't actually realize that, but you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean Heaven's Heaven's Gate is it's in the book now. Although it's not it wasn't strictly a secret society. The secrecy angle revolves around what a lot of people simply didn't realize was going on behind the scenes within the sort of the deeper components of the group and, you know, what its plans were and so on. So that, that's sort of the secret aspect of it. But it was created uh, by a man named Marshall Herf, excuse me, Marshall Herf Applewhite Jr. And he was someone who, again, like I mentioned earlier, was a charismatic type cult leader and that's typically what you nearly always get in an organization like this somebody who is very adept at manipulation and controlling people and promising this and promising that providing you do abc now he was someone who had a a controversial background and ironically had a from a young age you know his, his life was steeped in in, uh, in religion, you know, that's what he was brought up in. But he, he essentially moved away from it, you know, kind of like that sort of teenage rebellion kind of thing. And um, over the years, he created various groups and um, organizations, uh, one called the Total Overcomers Anonymous Group. Um, and that was uh, essentially also related to the idea that there were sort of friendly extraterrestrials out there that had our um, sort of best wishes at heart, so to speak, and providing that people followed um, his teachings then, you know, everything would be good and they would be the saved ones if anything happened to the planet. And this really kind of mutated and eventually morphed into the far more well-known Heaven's Gate. Uh, So it actually took a long time because it was in the 70s when Applewhite really got on, you know, this this track of creating organizations that he would oversee and, um, you know, he would have all these sort of... uh, uh, followers and this magnetic character that he had, you know, and um, this sense of follow me and everything will be good. But everything came up to um, a head in um, 1997. Now, the the time frame is an important one because this was when the comet known as Hale Bop um, was was essentially in our neighbourhood, so to speak. Um, and according to um, Applewhite, what he basically said was that there was a gigantic um, alien spacecraft behind the comet itself, behind Hale Bop, and essentially in like the wake or the tail of the comet, as they call it. And he convinced all of his followers that if they if their lives came to an end, um, their spirits essentially would be resurrected and they would essentially, you know, move into the domain or the dimension, if you like, of the aliens themselves. Now, 
what was particularly tragic was that some of the uh, followers, um, you know, weren't too clear about whether they should do this or not. But Applewhite actually made the decision for them very, very carefully. Uh, he encouraged them to drink um, what essentially was like a, a lethal cocktail, and it was a combination of um, vodka and phenobarbital. Oh. And um, what happened was that all the, the people there at the time, four, nearly 40 of them, um, did as they were told, and you know, their lives were over. And, of course, no uh, UFO was ever seen, you know, in the tail of the Hale-Bopp comet at all. This was just Applewhite's warped story as a means to, again, sort of have the ultimate control over, you know, his members, the ultimate mm -hmm. control, ironically, being death. And, um, and this actually happened at Rancho Santa Fe in California. And... Um, you know, not just the local police or state police abroad, but the FBI were heavily involved. And uh, not too long ago, the FBI declassified its whole file on the um, Heaven's Gate organization. It's a pretty large file, you know, that tells the background to the story and um, reveals, you know, what a, a controversial, dangerous figure Applewhite was. But this demonstrates, you know, that something like UFOs, which should be an area of intrigue, you know, and uh, fascination and um, interest in research sometimes can have uh, tragic results when the subject of UFOs gets hauled into and gets pulled into the issue of secret groups and charismatic leaders. Which is why anytime I go to a religious function, I never I never drink anything that's offered to me. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> yeah, just, just I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> no Kool-Aid. Yeah, no. no, no Kool-Aid. <laughs> you know, although the vodka might be hard to, to turn down. So <laughs> it's, it's funny, uh, <laughs> Nick, we were, when did I been talking about adding a, a social component to our radio show, which is where each week we actually feature a particular cocktail or a drink that either coincides with the topic or is one of the favorite uh, drinks of the guest or something like that. So <laughs> we will not have vodka and phenobarbital, and we will not have Kool-Aid <laughs> at any point. That I guarantee <laughs> <laughs> They are the so, yeah the band yeah. list. Yeah, we, we're not going to to to, to tackle that. Now, an, a, another group um, again, uh, and this is uh, more of a, I think Canadian and European. Uh, I'm not. I, I can't remember if they have a, a, a following in the U.S. or not. But that's the Raelians, which also are a, a secret society religious UFO group that you deal with in the, in this book. Well, yeah, I mean, again, you know, I try to sort of keep the book varied in terms of, you know, looking at different angles of, you know, what defines a secret society. And again, with the, with the Raelians, uh, named after a man named Claude Rael, a Frenchman, um, what's sort of more secret is not so much the existence of the group, but a, a full understanding of who they are and what they are and, and their beliefs, you know, as it relates to alien life and our species as a future in the future as well. Now, um, Claude um, Rail, his actually name was um, Claude Voilon, um, but he, in the early 1970s, had what we would call like a, a classic alien UFO contactee experience. Now, for people who aren't aware of it, contactees were primarily people in, back in the 50s and 60s who claimed very um, close encounters with eerily looking human aliens they were typically described as anywhere from sort of six foot to six foot five tall with long blonde hair and they looked very human like except for the fact back in the early 50s you know the men did obviously wear their hair sort of shoulder length but the space brothers did and they would typically warn people about the threats of nuclear war and ecological damage and how we need to change our ways before we destroy not just us but everything on the planet as well and Many of the people who um, claim these contactee experiences, like George Van Tassel, George Adamski, Truman Bethram, in the United States I'm talking about now, they developed massive followings um, to the point where George Van Tassel, for example, held these um, conferences out at Giant Rock in California in the, in the summer months. And he had um, audiences of like 10,000 sitting outside listening to all these contactees. And it, and it very much was like a, a cult-style um, 
situation. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative sense. I mean in the sense that so many people were driven to follow the words of this particular man, and they did. And certainly Claude Rael uh, was someone who did something very, very similar in the 1970s. And um, he had this sort of classic um, close encounter in France and when he was contacted by what he said was a, a representative of no, what's known as the Elohim, um, which is this sort of ancient um, species, if you like, intelligence, however you want to term it, um, whose origins sort of go back, you know, thousands of years. And he was reportedly told that um, the extraterrestrials um, had visited the Earth thousands of years ago They'd sort of genetically altered some of the early primitive humans by DNA manip manipulation and essentially um, led to the creation of our species, Homo sapiens. Uh, but it was all done through genetic tinkering, uh, according to the aliens that Rael uh, met with. Now, from there... When, um, in the when it was in the 1970s when all this happened, um, Rael decided to write a book about this, set up an organization, and in the 1970s put on a conference um, where people could come along and you know, listen to what he had to say and the nature of the group and so on. And roughly around about 200, excuse me, 2,000 people turned up, which is you know, quite respectable for a previously unknown organization um, and their following today is on a massive scale and it's very much like a cross between um, a religious organization and one that sort of worships in to some degree the extraterrestrial component of things as well um, but in the early 2000s uh, things got even more controversial <coughs> excuse me when the Raelians got involved in the issue of human cloning now the Raelians, they have a, an interesting and quite alternative belief system. They believe that the human body, if you like, and our soul exist, but when we die, everything dies with us. You know, they believe that we all have unique characters and characteristics, but they don't believe in an afterlife. And they believe that the only way to live forever is to constantly clone ourselves and have our memories sort of um, downloaded into the next clone and the next clone and when each one starts to wear out a new one will be grown for us and then our memories and our character and everything about us will be placed into the new clone so you know arguably you could have dozens of clones all age around about 30 or whatever age you wanted to stay at and when they start to degrade, you get a new 30-year-old body and so on. And so that was basically their belief system. And that is also how they believe that the sort of ancient gods, which they perceive as aliens, how they managed to uh, achieve immortality was via cloning, not by, you know, sort of um, manipulating the soul, which they actually don't believe exists. So in other words, in the early 2000s, this issue of human cloning and the Raelians actually eclipsed their, um, their UFO alien angle because people were saying, you know, this is reckless, we shouldn't be dabbling with the natural order of, of people, you know, and genetically altering them and creating sort of clone design of babies or whatever. So, and it actually spilled over into the mainstream media, you know, in terms of not just the ethics of all this, but whether it was actually legal or not to do it so you know it, it certainly placed the Raelians you know into the public eye in a big way yeah I remember when they uh, they kind of were making the news uh, CNN yeah. and then and then Fox yeah. and then uh, also you know you of course you know the uh, several of the the UFO shows at the time on on Fox Network actually if I remember they they did a series of interviews with with those individuals so it was very bizarre but you know very similar to some of the theories put forth by the the uh, some of the ancient astronaut theorists and and the Anunnaki and some of the things that they were doing so a, a little combination of, of different beliefs uh, kind of kind of across the board saying we'll take kind of like going Go, you're kind of a religious buffet, you know. We'll take this, we'll take that, we'll add this. No, we don't want that. Too many, too many religious calories. Uh, too much, too much, uh, too much substance to that one. We, you know, so just different things. Uh, Nick, I, I, I want to do something real quickly because Wendy just messaged me, and we need to do this. Um, we actually, when I reached out about this book, Secret Societies, and I reached out to your publicist. Uh, the, for who was actually the publicist for 365 Days of UFOs. Yeah. Well, she actually sent us some extra copies of 365 Days by accident. Oh, 
Uh, she she thought that we were requesting those. So we, I have actually two extra copies of 365 Days of UFOs. So Wendy and I thought about we would like to actually give one away on the show tonight. Okay. And what we did was we had people uh, – we, Wendy had posted that if they would come into the chat room, uh, if they wanted to ask a question, then she would choose someone at random and, and that per- we would ask you their questions. And then that person, I would mail them a copy of your book if that's okay with you. Oh, yeah. That's totally fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Wendy – I want yes. to send it over to you. Okay. Well, um, from Denise Prideborn, uh, she submitted two questions, and it kind of goes with the UFO and the the, uh, the oh so stable organizations. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, she wants to know how you got involved in UFO research. Okay. Well, um, it wasn't actually, as it is for some people, like a personal UFO encounter, but um, Mm -hmm. my dad was in the British Royal Air Force, Mm -hmm. uh, which is equivalent to the US Air Force, and he was a radar mechanic, and uh, he was involved in several UFO incidents. This was still at the height of the Cold War when the Soviet Union was around, Mm -hmm. and um, he was involved in several cases where in the early hours of the morning in September September 1952, um, he... uh, was part of a team that was involved in monitoring the skies because these strange uh, tracks had been picked up on the radar scopes on the first night of events and fighter planes were sent up to try and intercept them because the first thought was well, it's got to be the Soviets, you know, testing our defenses or, in a worst case, you know, launching a sneak attack. Mm-hmm. But the pilots reported seeing not sort of Soviet bombers or fighter planes, but these strange balls of light. Uh, imagine something like a camera flash in intensity, but not going off, just constantly staying on. That's how bright these things were. But they were performing all sorts of maneuvers, showing they were clearly under intelligent control and would follow the aircraft and then shoot away at high speed and so on. Well, this went on for three nights, and um, my dad was brought in because, as a radar mechanic, he was asked to check out all the equipment to make sure it wasn't malfunctioning and creating false readings on the screens. But the important thing was, of course, that the pilot it wasn't just being... They weren't just being tracked on the radar. The pilots were seeing them in the sky, too. And um, and everybody was told, you know, you won't talk about this. We don't want this to go any further. And certainly my dad didn't tell anyone until, like, decades and decades later when I was about 11 or 12, and he told me the story of this. And that's what got me interested, really, and as sort of a an early teenage, you know, around about that age, I started reading books by people like John Keel and Brad Steiger, whose books, you know, I particularly enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And that sort of really got me interested in the subject. So, I, I mean, who knows? I may have sort of moved towards it anyway, but certainly um, it probably wouldn't have been to the degree that, you know, it, it has been uh, had my dad not told me the story of his own encounters. Sure, that that certainly adds a personal element to it yeah um she also asks if a let me see uh people who get abducted always recognize that they were that they had experienced an abduction um no not always i mean sometimes people have full full 100 percent conscious recollection of of being taken on board a ufo and you know and subjected to some sort of medical procedure etc now there are other cases where people um, think they've you know they're driving home late at night and they have like a vague sense that something weird happened and the only thing they can kind of remember is that they slowed the car down and like for example a deer ran across the road and stopped in the middle of the road in front of them for about ten minutes and they couldn't get past and then finally it ran off and they continued on their drive but then afterwards they started to get weird dreams now mm-hmm. this has sort of created the idea or led to the idea that what the deer or, you know, whatever animal it was, a moose or whatever that ran across the road and stopped the car uh, from going any further was what's called a screen memory. Now, a screen memory is a legitimate phenomenon. It's where the human mind creates an image to block out a far more traumatic image or your mind blocks it out completely so you don't remember it. And one of the theories is that some abductions, it's possible that the alien entities themselves can create a screen image uh, and a screen memory so we don't remember the events in the slightest. All you remember is this vague, strange night when you saw a deer in the road and it stared at you and 
and then it ran off, and then you have a kind of a mixed-up memory as to what happened next. So in some cases, it's blurry like that. And there are some cases where people just start to have weird nightmares, and when they're hypnotized, it turns out that, the again, the, uh, the nightmares that they're having are a distorted version of a real event, which was a, an abduction. And this gives rise to the idea that, you know, the, the abductions themselves are provoked and controlled by the fact that these alien entities can wipe our minds. Once they clean, because obviously people do recollect them after hypnosis, but certainly, you know, efforts are taken on the part of the extraterrestrials or whatever they might be mm -hmm. um, to prevent us getting the full picture of what happened during the abduction. Incredibly frightening. Now, um, Denise is, uh, that's Denise Pridemore, and she and her husband, Ron, run the uh, uh, the Sally House investigations up in Atchison, Kansas. Um, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. I met her up there and at a, a different place here in Kansas City once or twice, and very interesting lady. Uh, that Actually, that's all the questions I have right now. Um, I've, I've had a lot of, of people saying, ooh, great show. <laughs> great guest, great show, great guest, but <laughs> but well, I'm glad that Denise submitted her questions. And Denise, mm -hmm. if you will get Wendy your address, I will mail your book out tomorrow morning. She's going to visit you in Preston, Burke, because at the she station because she's going to be on vacation there next week. Is she really? Tell her to come uh -huh. on by. Yeah, she will if they have time. Well, tell her that would be great. I'll put her on the. She <laughs> if she comes in Wednesday, I'll put her on the radio with my white supremacist if they come into the radio station. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you want to do that, Travis. Uh, I, we'd feel the effects here in Kansas City of that explosion. <laughs> no, it, it, is she seriously coming? She's not coming yes. to Prestonsburg. Yes. Uh, is she really? Yeah, she's. Uh, they're headed to Vegas, and I'm sorry, Denise, I'm giving your itinerary on the internet. Um, they're going to we Vegas, don't... and then they're headed to Eastern Kentucky. Excuse me, I believe to visit her pregnant daughter, or it, oh. it's something like that. Um, well. Mm -hmm. Tell her uh, she will definitely have to come by, and, and even if it's just for a couple of minutes, they they should stop by, and uh, maybe I can take them out to lunch or something. There you go. And I'm I'm serious, Denise. <laughs> yep. If you're still listening or um, not. <laughs> Whatever. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I will I, then I will just hold her copy of the book until she comes and sees me. I'll just hold it ransom. She has to come and see me now. She's not getting the book unless she does. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> now what? <laughs> One more UFO secret society, uh, Nick, and then there's a couple of other just odds and ends that I want that I want to pick up on. Majestic Twelve, one of the probably one of the most uh, talked about in recent years secret societies, uh, kind of is born out of Roswell and the UFO crash there. What what did your research tell you? What do we know about Majestic Twelve? What don't we know about Majestic Twelve? What will we never know about this organization? Well, Majestic 12 is one of these controversial secret groups, uh, which again, allegedly, uh, over the years and decades, has been um, controlled and run by um, significant figures in the US military intelligence community and government. Um, now, within ufology itself, you know, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not the story of Majestic 12 is accurate or even true or if it's some sort of strange hoax put together by who knows what and, and even to this day um <clears throat> you know we're still debating on it there are some researchers like kevin randall who you know he's a believer in the theory that aliens crashed at roswell but he doesn't believe a group called majestic 12 was created to oversee the roswell wreckage and bodies now stan friedman who's you know been mm -hmm. involved in um, the Roswell investigation for decades. Stan is a firm believer in the ex in the existence of MJ-12. So, in other words, you know, there's a lot of dispute even between people who hold very similar beliefs about Roswell. But the the story basically is that after the uh, Roswell event occurred, this highly classified group was put together called Majestic 12, which some people also refer to as MJ-12. And the um, the membership involved sort of high-ranking government people um, like James Forrestal, who was the uh, first Secretary of Defence, 
uh, but also powerful scientists like Vannevar Bush, Dr. Vannevar Bush, and people in the intelligence community uh, in sort of pre-CIA years. And the idea was to create this group which could oversee the UFO issue and keep the Roswell bodies and the Roswell craft under wraps and essentially not just away from the public and the media, but it would also be hidden from most of the government as well. You know, it was like a, a government within a government and answerable to no one. Um, and over the years, various people have come forward claiming knowledge of the group, various so-called leaked documents from... Uh, whistleblowers, I guess, if you like, have come forward and, you know, the government has said, no, these are documents are fakes, they're just hoax, they're not real, you know, and then um, researchers have said, well, yes, they are real. And that's kind of where we are today. Uh, the, the MJ-12 documents, uh, or at least the first batch of them, surfaced publicly in 1987. So actually talking 30 years ago now, since they first um, hit the uh, headlines, so to speak, and there's still a great deal of debate as to what they show, what they demonstrate. Do they actually show anything truthful, or is it some bizarre government psychological operation to try and push us, push us away from another angle? Um, we don't really know, but so uh, what I did with the book was sort of tell the story of Majestic 12 and the theories behind it, and, um, and really sort of leave it up to the reader to sort of, you know, come to their own conclusions because it's such a convoluted area of, you know, study that um, it's like a hall of mirrors, you know, you just don't know which direction to go in. And maybe that's part of the, you know, the goal is to keep us guessing and keep us away from who knows what. So. Well, now, you, you as as we have, have talked many times, you have your own, you know, interest in, the, in ufology and, and your research. What's your personal opinion on Majestic 12? Well, I think the best I could say was that if aliens did crash, then it would make great sense for an, an MJ-12 type group to be created because to keep the secret of a crashed UFO and dead aliens, you would have to, to prevent too many people finding out, you would have to restrict the membership and the number of people who knew about it. And the only way you could do that, I think, would be to hand over all the material evidence, all the documents, the photographs, autopsy reports, everything, you would have to hand that over to a highly classified group with a small membership to ensure that the secrets never got out. So I, I think the big irony is that whether or not MJ-12 existed or not, whatever happened at Roswell, there would have been a group along those lines um, created to handle it all so in that sense you know um, it makes sense but whether it makes sense because you know it's the perfect theory or whether it means that there really was a group that's the question we're still answer, uh, still asking so. kind of the jack the ripper of ufology well yeah it actually <laughs> really is because again you know you've got multiple theories for what happened like a ufo crash um secret military experiment using people um, time travelers, um, something that the Russians sent over and crashed. Um, there's theories about a, an atomic bomb that was mistakenly dropped flying over New Mexico and, you know, was hidden to hide the fact that we almost sort of, you know, were <laughs> nuked uh, Almogordo or whatever, you know. Yep. Um, so, you know, it's like Jack the Ripper, there's numerous engaging and mysterious theories um, and even the government's put out several different theories to explain Roswell um, but you know it, it is like Jack the Ripper in the sense it's getting older and older and it's going from that I don't mean that I don't mean there aren't facts surrounding the case but it's going from being sort of perceived like a factual event to a bit of sort of historical American like Americana you know yeah, exactly becoming almost yeah exactly now there was one other. This isn't really u ufology or UFO, and it's not really a secret society as much as it is uh, a location and an organization. 
uh, that has been tied to uh, things such as uh, Project Rainbow and the uh, uh, the Philadelphia experiment, and that is the Montauk Project. And if anybody is is a fan of the the Netflix series Stranger Things, as I am, okay. uh, this the, the the concept of the Montauk Project actually was the inspiration uh, for the Duff Brothers when they created Stranger Things. It was also one of the inspirations for Stephen King's The Mist, and a very interesting story montauk i discovered probably uh almost 20 years ago uh i was doing some internet research on dial-up internet years ago before there was high speed and before there was <laughs> wi-fi and things like that um but tell us i mean a lot of people are not familiar with montauk because it's one of those uh it, it seems to be more of an urban legend secret than it really is kind of mainstream conspiracy oh. theory well, yeah, I mean, Montauk as a location certainly exists. It's, it's, it's located on Long Island, and its origins go back to 1917 and what was called the Naval Air Station Montauk. And it, it's lo- it was located, and the, you know, the remains still are, on the south shore of Long Island. And uh, it played a sort of a significant, uh, very significant role in the Second World War because one of the big fears was that the Japanese, who had, you know, a number of advanced submarines, would sort of, you know, sort of stealthily head around the U.S. coastline and surface near New York and then proceed to, you know, launch a a sea-based attack. So with uh, Montauk actually being, you know, uh, situated on Long Island, it was a perfect case to have this, uh, you know, this sort of observation installation in, in place, you know, to look out for some sort of Japanese attack. Now, there have been rumours over the years that um, in the post-war, immediate post-war era, um, the underground parts of Montauk were massively extended upon, and all sorts of strange experiments were undertaken there, and certainly. The one that perhaps most people tie it to is this sort of legend of a Second World War 1943 experiment on the part of the U.S. Navy to try and make a warship invisible, like optical invisibility. Um, And it's become known as the Philadelphia Experiment, and numerous books have been written about it, novels, a a couple of movies about it, and even controversial stories that the at least one of the ships used in this particular series of experiments briefly time traveled um, into the future and then back again to 1943 with sort of disastrous psychological and physical effects on the crew. Um, And the the stories it relates to Montauk is this sort of secret group of scientists deep below Long Island were working on sort of time travel technology uh, which also sort of opened doorways to alien visitations and supposedly even allowing the human mind to sort of create um, bizarre creatures like Bigfoot type creatures in their minds which sort of strode out into the real world and then sort of they lost control over them. But there's numerous books written all about the, the Montauk secrets and the, the secret group that oversees it. And um, But like Majestic 12, it, it's, a, it's a controversial area um, which has a lot of interesting data surrounding it, but there's so far there's no sort of smoking gun of you know these Montauk experiments. Um, it also uh, several years ago, and this you know I think has been debunked and, and disproven. But there was the Montauk monster that had apparently washed up on the shore yeah. there. The photograph that was taken uh, and and made its circles uh, or it made its way through the the cryptid circles and and things like that. Now there's one other real quick. Uh, segment in in your book that I want to touch on before we talk to you about your your new projects because when we were kind of in the quote unquote virtual green room waiting on Wendy's song <laughs> to finish playing so we so we could come on we were talking about the projects that you're working on and I want to talk to you about that in the and, and wrap up in the last few minutes um, but there's one and it's a story that I was familiar with I think actually John Keel had mentioned it in one of his books and then I come across it in a few other uh, books on you know, unexplained phenomena, but you again tie it to a, a kind of secret uh, society, and that is, the, <laughs> and I can't even say this title without laughing: the Mad Gaster of Mattoon. <laughs> well, that's a very bizarre story. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Mattoon is a town in Illinois, and back in the 1940s, um, what happened 
was that um, a number of women reported these strange attacks in the middle of the night where this sort of creepy character would break into the house or actually would, would find his way into the house, but very often there was no actual evidence of a break-in, you know, like broken windows or forced locks. And people described him, funnily enough, not unlike the men in black today. He'd have like a long black coat on and some sort of hat and um, had sort of this penetrating look on his face and this sort of menacing cold eyes. And um, it was called the Mad Gasser of Matum because people said that when he was in the room, the the bed and it was typically usually the bedroom and he would be sort of looming over them that the room would be filled with this overwhelming um sort of strong pungent odor which actually <laughs> placed them into like a like a state of unconsciousness or at the very least sort of affected their mental and physical faculties where you know they felt drugged and and couldn't fight this man off now fortunately nobody was sort of directly harmed it was just more of a traumatic experience um but what happened was that um the the mad gasser he, he sort of came and you know went he was like sort of a you know such a stealthy character that he was never caught and, and again different theories are put forward that uh, as to who he was was he a local man was it some sort of deranged sort of serial killer that had you know, the people, the people have been fortunate enough not to be killed, or did it have supernatural overtones? Um, but there's also another intriguing theory that suggests that there wasn't just a mad gasser, but there may have been multiple mad gassers and connected to some sort of... It, it, there's some of the information has surfaced through the Freedom of Information Act, but it's very brief and sort of friend of a friend stuff that the intelligence agents intelligence agencies got their information on and it supposedly revolved around a sort of a cult type group in northern illinois that was uh, following the teachings of alistair crowley who's somebody who pops up in a lot of um secret societies over the years and one of the theories that was put forward was that the whole point of these break-ins was actually to perform human sacrifice in the name of sort of ancient supernatural deities again as i mentioned earlier like for personal gain for power for money for, for influence and so on and fortunately obviously none of these women were killed um uh, because after the one at the first one or two attacks the police were sort of on guard and you know neighbors were keeping vigilance and so on so nothing fortunately actually happened but this is one of the intriguing theories that this sort of cult um inspired by crowley sort of crossed the line and had the intent of breaking into people's homes and sacrificing them and but it all became it all fell under the banner of this legendary creepy man in black character known as the mad gasser of Matoon, which may have been the, the you know the title and the imagery may have been influenced by the group to sort of make people think, you know, it was just nonsense and push you down like a supernatural path to cover their tracks if they actually achieved what it was they were trying to do. Yep. So what projects are you working on right now? Because you and I had talked, and you, you said something very interesting. I thought, you know, you, you said that, you know, you were finishing up a book, and which would be released very soon because books no longer took months and months to write. It, it was yeah. getting, you know, and... and a real quick question: How do you feel about that as a, as a as an author and as a writer? Do do you miss the days when it would take you, when when you kind of quote unquote toil over the story and what you were writing, or do you prefer this this faster pace of publishing? Well, I mean, you know, I think the writing of the book depends is always going to be dependent on you know the the nature of the story and how much information you've got and how much you've got to find. And so sometimes it can take, if I've got all the information, I can write the book in about two months. But if it requires a lot of investigative work and, you know, going out on site and road trips, you know, a book can take, take a year. But mm -hmm. what I do like with the, you know, new technology or relatively recent technology is that it doesn't take the publisher you know, anywhere near as long as it used to, to get a pub, to get a book published. You know, the times were when publishers would say, well, you know, we've got three or four books coming out and, you know, we need to publish them in the order that we get them so yours won't be out for 18 months. That doesn't happen today because very often you have what are called print-on-demand companies where mm -hmm. the, the book basically doesn't exist until people order it. You know, you get a lot of 
and that's a good way of doing it really so publishers aren't forced to publish say 10,000 copies and worry they're not going to sell you know they but still might sell 10,000 but they they sell as they're ordered you know, that's right. what they're called print on demand and that works quite well really and there's also the fact that the technology is much quicker today you know i mean for me i just write the the you know the books in a word document then it comes back to me as a converted into a pdf with all the styling and the you know the layout and i read that make sure it all looks good goes back the cover designer puts the cover together within a few days that cover's all designed and then he goes on Amazon, you know, the next week. So uh, I like I like the speed in that sense. So, um, but I don't like to be rushed on writing a book. If I can write it in two months, it's because I'm comfortable doing it at that rate. But something like Secret Societies that took me about nine months to write that book altogether. Something like that. Well, it's very extensive. I mean, just a lot of information. Uh, but like I said, not a difficult read. I highly recommend folks uh, ordering this book. Uh, but before we tell them how they can do that, what what are the new projects that you were you and I were discussing? Well, the one that I've got coming out, which will be out round about the end of May, early June, is a, a new book on Roswell, and um, Roswell is celebrating its seventieth anniversary this July. So it's basically you know me talking about my latest findings on the case. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I think the 70th anniversary is sort of a a cool way to sort of, you know, tell the story. And the other one that I've got coming out comes out in September through uh, Llewellyn Books, who've done a few of my books previously. And it's called Shapeshifters. Now, if you mention shapeshifters to people, you know, they think of werewolves. Um, But throughout history, folklore, mythology and culture, you can find numerous stories of different animals and also of people allegedly shape-shifting into all sorts of different creatures. So it's sort of like a, a historical look at the at the different stories of, you know, um, sort of morphing monsters, so to speak, is probably the best way to describe it. <laughs> and it's sort of like a cross between cryptozoology meets the supernatural, something along mm-hmm. those lines. Very cool. So we So you have one coming out end of May, 1st of June, and then you've got one coming out in the fall. Yeah, then September, uh, September. Excuse me, in September be the Shapeshifters book. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to have you back on to talk about those. Oh yes, please. I appreciate that. Now, yeah. how can how can folks order your books and follow what you're doing and and, and get in touch with you if they have a story they want to share? Um, well, uh, all the books are available on Amazon, and probably uh, sixty seventy percent of them you can get off the shelves in Barnes and Noble as well. Uh, people can reach me at my blog, which is Nick Redfern Fortian, which is F O R T E A N, Nick Redfern Fortian dot blogspot dot com, or just type in Nick Redfern World of Whatever, and that's the title of the blog, and you'll you'll easily find it. Um, people can also reach me at uh, Facebook. Um, there's a few Nick Redferns, but just scroll down and you'll you'll find me. And um, people can always always contact me at uh, either the blog or. At Facebook, I'm always, you know, pleased to chat with people or if they've got questions, um, you know, if I can answer them, I will. And uh, Or if they just want to share a story and, you know, get my opinion on it, uh, again, I'm always happy to do that. I, I, you know, I'm one of these who I feel we're all in this together, you know, and, um, and if we can all kind of share information and figure out what's going on, chances are we're going to solve a lot of these mysteries quicker. You know, I don't have much time for the, you know, all the egos in the subject. You know, I just... I, <laughs> I'm one of these. I like to, you know, get out there and meet the people, you know, and um, and see what we can find out. So that's why you're our kind of Fordian. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have we we need to have uh, shirts made up. Uh, Nick Redfern, he's our kind of Fordian. I think that would work. Uh, be our own, we'll be our own secret society. So, <laughs> Ooh, part Nick, of the, thank you. you are now part of the Mystic Moon Mafia. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> you have been inducted. <laughs> we're not going to re- we're not going to resort to cannibalism, though. So. No, let's not do that. Let's do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> and no Kool Aid. We've already discussed no Kool Aid. Right, right. Vod- vodka, phenobarbital optional, depending on what you have your taste. <laughs> so, oh, but I, I have to ask. I'm going to ask this real quickly. In in preparation for the next time we have you on the show, what would be the drink you would want us to to feature during that show, Nick? 
Oh, um, well, that'd be easy. It's uh, an English um, ice cold beer called um, Tenant Super, which is extremely strong. <laughs> okay, we'll have to. We will look it's into good... getting some. <laughs> All right, T E N N E N T S. Tenant okay. Soup. Thank you. I was Ex- about to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We want definitely. I'll be in touch. We'll have you back on uh, sometime in June to discuss your book on Roswell, but or, or maybe in July. We may we may wait closer to the anniversary. This is the the seventieth anniversary of the UFO crash there in Roswell. Uh, but we'll have you on sometime in the summer. And then we'll have you on in the fall to discuss shape to discuss shapeshifters. So all right. At, as always, a pleasure having you on Mystic Moon. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank a lot. you. Thank you. See you later. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Next week, next week, our buddy Bill Bean yes. will be back on. Yes, Bill will be back on. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, the Mandela effect. We'll be discussing demonic possession, exorcisms, deliverances, uh, dark force delivered, UFOs, conspiracy theories, the uh, Large Hedron Collider and CERN and multiple dimensions, parallel universes. The list goes on and on. You never know what Bill Bean is going to discuss when he comes on the show. No, you really, really don't. But then uh, again, we uh, never know what we're going to discuss. We never, so That's true. Since he's, going to, since he's going to be in Miami, we may be discussing beach blanket bingo. Who knows? Oh! Um, <laughs> I know. You it's see what wrong. I did there? I know. I know. Yes. It's so wrong. <laughs> so wrong indeed. And he won't even oh. let us join him. I know. I know. You know, if he were a good client, he'd ask me to come along with him on these projects. But Very true. Uh, and you I, know I, you need I, a secretary. Yes. Well, you know, I actually, you know, he, he, he does these trips to perform exorcisms, deliverances. I really would love to go with him on one because I would love to, to document videotape from, mm-hmm. from beginning to end the whole process. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the, uh, if the individual would, would be so willing, I think it would be a, an amazing, uh, story to tell in video form, but that's yet to be seen. So well, and d- down there in, uh, down there in, in Miami, they probably practice a lot of Santeria. Is that correct? <laughs> They should, yeah. You're getting, mm-hmm. you know, you're getting down there deep, uh, deep south. Uh, you know, especially get into to South Voodoo, Beach. They practice Voodoo, all kinds. They, yeah. they they practice all kinds of things in South <laughs> Beach. <laughs> yes, uh, they do. <laughs> so, <laughs> we don't have to so, mention all uh, of them. <laughs> we, we no, we don't. We won't. Mm-hmm. We we will. We <laughs> we will leave that where it is. Yes. Uh, but. Uh, We will be back next Wednesday night, 9 o'clock. Bill Bean will be our guest. We're working on some great guests for the month of May. And obviously we'll have Nick Redfern on sometime in the summer and then again sometime in the fall to discuss these two great books. And I will make sure uh, that we get copies of those. And I'll try to make sure that they, they actually get to us in time. Uh, as opposed to to me, period. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. To you, period, which, you know, I don't know. They, people just look at the one email address or the one address in the email. That's where they Mm -hmm. send stuff. So. So I apologize. Oh, but uh, you have a song to take us out, I believe. Sure. Um, I figured we'd go with Katie Gian, um, back in Kansas City. Good, strong, fast blues song. <laughs> Excellent. Looking forward to it. Well, I, I, I can't hear it. So <laughs> I was going to say, looking forward to yeah. hearing it. But Ooh. I can't. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll forward it to you on Facebook or something. <laughs> looking forward. Mm-hmm. Looking right, forward. Mm-hmm. So have a great Wednesday evening, and I will talk to you t- uh, probably tomorrow. Okie dokie. Night, everybody. Okay. everybody thank have you for a listening. Great, safe Wednesday. Yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And back in Kansas City.
and that was Katie Gian, uh Kansas City native, spelled G-U-I-L-L-E-N. Um, I've seen her live at Knucklehead Saloon down in, down in the bottoms. Fun place, little scary place, scary neighborhood for sure. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for listening, and we will see you, talk to you next week, next Wednesday. Denise, get a hold of Travis, or get a hold of me on Facebook, and, and we will discuss the terms of you receiving that book. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. You've been listening to Mystic Moon Cafe. Join us every Wednesday from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. On behalf of Wendy Schindler, this is Travis Short saying have a great rest of your week. Yeah, that's all, folks. Thank you.